everyone, and welcome back to our journey through multivariable calculus. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of partial derivatives and total derivatives and discuss a little bit more about the chain rule and how it works in the multivariable world. So what is the chain rule from single variable calculus? Well, we first start off with a function, let's say w, um, and it can be represented as a function of other functions, say g, which is a function of some single variable x, right? So f is a function of x, but x has to go through g before it gets to f, right? So we usually call this a composition function. And we want to know how w is changing with respect to x. That is, how is f changing with respect to x? Well, first f has to change with respect to g, and then g directly changes with respect to x. And in the single variable calculus, where we write this as dw over dx is equal to f prime of g of x times g prime of x. And that's usually what we usually memorize for the chain rule in single variable calculus. From this perspective of differentials, and this is going to be a little bit more useful for us today, is that dw dx is equal to, so if we sort of look at this expression, g of x is all sort of acting like a variable for f prime. So we can actually write this as df over dg, and then this is the derivative of g with respect to x, so we can write this as dg over dx. Now, if you believe that um, quotients of differentials are practically like fractions, you can sort of see that this dg and this dg would sort of cancel if you believe in such things. And then we have dw over dx is equal to df over dx because w and f practically uh, represent the same exact object, right? But this would be the chain rule in the single variable world. So what are exactly are we going to be looking at today? And actually, why do we care? So w is now going to be a function of two functions, u and v, and u and v are both going to be functions of these independent variables x and y. All right, so there's a couple of questions that one may be interested in finding. For example, we could be interested in the partial derivative of w with respect to x, or you could be interested in the total derivative of w with respect to x, right? So this again, is referred to as a partial derivative, and this is referred to as a total derivative, or in some sense, the classical, the implicit total derivative. So what exactly do these objects focus on? So this considers only the influence, influence of the x variable, so that's its primary focus. And dw dx um, focuses, focuses primarily, primarily on the influence of x and considers, considers also the potential, potential influence of y and the other variables of consideration, right? Z, T, and so on, right? So how are we going to explore this topic? Let's start off with the partial derivative first. So as x and y change, our functions u and v also change. And as u and v change, as u and v change, our w changes, which in, is kind of like our f, right? So this is pretty much the tree or sequence that we're looking at. So how are we going to approximate these things? So the partial derivative of u with respect to x would be approximated by our discrete change in u divided by our discrete change in x. Our partial derivative of u with respect to y would be approximated similarly, the uh, discrete change in u over the discrete change in y. So partial y. And then the partial derivative of u with respect to or v with respect to x would be approximately the discrete change in v over the discrete change in x. And the partial derivative of v with respect to y would be approximately equal to the discrete change in v divided by the discrete change in y. So those will be our individual approximations. 
So if we're interested in analyzing the discrete change in W, which can also be viewed as a discrete change in F, then this can be approximated as the cumulative change across U and also V. So therefore, we're interested in the partial derivative of F with respect to U proportional to that discrete change in U. And then we're also going to be interested in the total, since we're interested in the total derivative, generally speaking, of the partial derivative of f with respect to v times the proportionality of that discrete change in v. So we can re-represent each of these objects. For example, we have uh, delta u with respect to x and delta v with respect to x, and we can just replace those things in here uh, in case you're interested in how w is changing with respect to x. So once we do that, we're gonna have partial f partial u multiplied by our discrete change in u, which is just going to be the partial u partial x times delta x. And then we're going to have over here partial f partial v, and then times the discrete change in v, which is just going to be our partial v partial x times our delta x. So that's going to be equal to partial v partial x times our delta x. And then what we can do is if we're interested in the change uh, in w with respect to x, we can just divide everything by the discrete change in x, and that gives us an approximation for partial w partial x. So once we clean that up a bit, which that's going to give us what? So partial w partial x would then be equal to, once we send um, delta w and delta x to zero, we're gonna have the exact partial, and that's gonna be equal to partial f partial u times partial u partial x plus partial f partial v uh, times partial v partial x, right? And this is gonna be our typical um, structure for the chain rule with respect to x. And similarly, you can do it for y. So we can also write the partial derivative with respect to y will be equal to, again, partial f partial u there. We're gonna have a partial f partial v there. So those will stay consistent regardless of the variable you have. The only difference is now we're gonna do partial u partial y and then partial v partial y. And that will give you the chain rule for partials in the x and y direction. Now, this is not the only thing you can say. So if, if x and y are independent variables, which they typically are since they're usually used as just um, arbitrary inputs of a function, um, then we can actually write that dw dx will be equal to partial w partial x, and we can also write that part dw dy will be equal to partial w partial y. So if that's the case, then we can actually rewrite our particular object as follows. So that means that dw dx will be equal to partial f partial u times du over dx. So we have a partial times a total derivative, and then we're gonna have partial f partial v times total v dx. And similarly, dw dy, so the total derivative of w with respect to y, will be equal to, again, partial f partial u times total u total x, actually y, and then partial f partial v, and then total v total y. So those will be the chain rules um, in the multivariable spectrum. And again, if w is a, indirectly a function of x, y, and z, then you would just be adding a couple more terms depending on how many variables you would have in that particular sequence. So keep in mind, you can technically avoid this formula when you're calculating, for example, dw over dx, because you can use, say, partial derivatives, um, implicit differentiation from single variable calculus, and then sort of combine them in a systematic approach. But this sort of gives you a very direct way for finding these particular elements. Um, but these formulas actually do have a lot of theoretical significance when deriving other very important relationships, which we'll get to later, and also for solving some problems where, you know, uh, you know, let's say W depends on, for example, happiness and stress, and happiness and stress both depend on, say, time and money or something like that, right? So it does give us a couple bit more tools that we can put in our toolbox for solving problems in a more easier and efficient fashion. So let's actually go through an app 
uh, application where the chain rule can actually be used to make things quite easy for us. So let's assume that we're interested in modeling the temperature of a plate at any point x, y within that two-dimensional plate. So what we're going to do, if it's for example a uniform distribution with no heat source or uh, no heat sink anywhere in the system, um, as t goes to infinity, technically speaking, the surface of the plate should have the same temperature everywhere. But what we're going to assume now is that there is a Gaussian heat source, and when you see the word Gaussian, sometimes thinking, oh, normal distribution or a bell-shaped curve is usually going to be appropriate in that context. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a Gaussian heat source at the origin with a heat generation given by uxy equals e to the power of minus x squared plus y squared. So that's your typical Gaussian structure in two dimensions. And let's also assume that we have a cooling vent along the x-axis with heat extraction given by vxy equals 1 over 1 plus x squared. So keep in mind the Gaussian heat source and the uh, heat extraction function all have this particular bell-shaped curve, one more extreme than the other. So for example, um, we're going to be having a Gaussian uh, heat source, so we're going to have sort of this mountain going in both directions, but we're only going to be having a vent in the x direction, not the y direction. Okay, so once we have that, keep in mind the farther we get from the origin, um, the less heat we extract, but that sort of makes sense because the heat is not going to be as extreme the farther and farther you get from the origin. So with this uh, heat source and this heat sink, I guess you could say, we can actually model this temperature reasonably well, assuming that time is held constant, via the function Txy is equal to u times 1 minus v. Notice here that t depends on u and v, and u and v depend on x. So if we're interested in how the temperature is changing in the x direction only, the y direction only, or the y direction with potential uh, potential influence with x, or the x direction with potential influence of y, the chain rule actually uh, comes very naturally as a uh, a material structure that we can use to solve those types of problems. So once we have this, what we need to do is just represent our function, which is technically a function of u and v, um, and analyze the functions u and v with respect to x. So keep in mind, u is equal to e to the minus x squared minus y squared, and v was equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared. So let's find some derivatives for these u and v functions. So if we take the derivative of u partially with respect to x, keep in mind y is going to be a constant there, so we're going to have the derivative of exponential, which is exponential, and the derivative of that quadratic with respect to x is just going to be minus 2x, so we're just going to have minus 2x multiplied by u, which is e to the minus x squared minus y squared. And then if we take u with respect to y, we practically get the same thing, just e to the minus 2y times e to the minus x squared minus y squared. Now let's do the same for v, so v with respect to x, so we can do an inverse uh, chain rule by re representing this as just 1 plus x squared to the minus 1, um, bringing that minus 1 down, change the power to minus 2, and then multiplying by 2x. So that's going to be equal to what? So that's going to be equal to minus 2x all over 1 plus x squared, the quantity squared. And since v doesn't have x, uh, doesn't have y in it, the partial derivative with respect to y will just be equal to zero because everything with x in it is just a constant. So that's our single partial derivatives with respect to u and v. So now let us analyze the partial derivative of t with respect to u and the partial of t with respect to v. Again, keep in mind that t xy is equal to u times 1 minus v. So technically you can say that t is a function of u and v only and analyze it from this perspective. So what would the partial derivative of t with respect to u be? So t subscript u. So keep in mind, v is going to be a constant. So when we actually look at that, that's the, just the partial with respect to u of u minus uv. So that's just going to be equal to what? So that's just going to be equal to 1 minus v. And similarly speaking, partial t with respect to v, aka tv, which is just partial partial v of u minus uv. So that means u is a constant, and we're just going to be left with minus u. right? So that's going to be equal to tu, and that's going to be equal to tv. All right, so we have ux, uy, vx, vy, tu, tv, and u and x depends on 
x and y. So now we can analyze how t changes with respect to x and how t changes with respect to y. So let's sort of look at how that would go. So how is t changing partially with respect to x? So let's write that as partial t partial x, which I will denote from here on as just t script script x. So by the chain rule for multiple variables, that's just going to be equal to t u times u x plus t v times v x. So once I actually substitute these particular things in, so t u will be equal to 1 minus v and v was equal to one over one plus x squared. And then u with respect to x was just equal to minus two x times e to the minus one half, or no one half, x squared plus y squared in parentheses. So that gives us t u times u x. And once we have that, what are we going to have? Let's make sure we're not missing anything. No, nope, everything seems to be okay. So we have tu times ux, and then we're going to have tv, which is going to be minus u. So u is going to be equal to minus the Gaussian function, so minus e to the minus uh, x squared plus y squared. And then we're going to have vx, and vx came out to minus 2x all over 1 plus x squared, the quantity squared. Right? So that's going to be equal to tu ux plus tvvx, um, which is just a function of x and y. So when we actually simplify all this crazy looking math out, but it's actually not too bad, we can actually find tx can be nicely re represented as 2x times 1 minus x to the power of 4 minus x squared times a little Gaussian function minus x squared minus y squared all over x squared plus 1, the quantity squared. So if you're just interested in how x is changing with respect to how temperature is changing with respect to x only or in the x direction, that function will model that perfectly for you. And similarly, let's assume that we're interested in ty. So what will ty be? So ty will, will be equal to, again, tu times uy plus tv times vy. And once you actually do out all that math, one can find, at least for this example, uh, this is going to be a little bit more easier because vy came out to zero. So that's going to be minus 2x squared y all over 1 plus x squared times our little Gaussian function. So that's going to be how you can analyze how things are changing in the y direction. So you can obviously grab those in MATLAB or whatever graphical software you want to sort of analyze, you know, how things are changing in those directions. You can also, you know, look at the concavity or the convexity by looking at TXX and TYY in a similar fashion. So this is how you do a uh, chain rule with multiple variable functions and a couple little side uh, formulas that are super easy to use and very useful in the future. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.